thank you so much for inviting me. It has been a pleasure to listen to the other speakers. I've learned a lot from you yesterday and this morning too. And I'm happy to be here um, to present the parents' um, appeal against drug use. And I'll tell you more about this. Um, firstly, I'll say a bit about the organization I'm representing. I am, uh, as you said, the General Secretary of Audit in Norway. We are a member organization, an NGO, with uh, a history of 140 years, um, with members that have chosen not to use alcohol or other drugs. Um, and we do prevention work, uh, mainly kind of targeting the parents and families. Um, and we do um, um, uh, also uh, quite a lot of rehabilitation work in addition to the other things mentioned about what we do. Um, I also have to say I am a parent myself and it's important to say because lots of the critics that we uh, received doing this um, parents appeal was that we did not represent parents. I had three <laughs> young boys, they're actually adults now. I have three uh, young men, boys between 18 and 25 years. So I'm really <laughs> kind of personally involved in this question. Uh, of course, since my boys are in the target group for the industry and also at risk, um, as the attitudes towards drugs are um, changing in Norway these days. Let's see. Um, I, will, I will guide you through or take you through four talking points. It's uh, why we did this, and to explain a bit more <laughs> about what actually happened, what kind of suggestion uh, the government uh, proposed in Norway about uh, this drug liberalization. Uh, and then, of course, how we did it, uh, what was the outcome of it, and <laughs> we also have started the discussion now how should we proceed. What is to come now and what should we do about it? It was actually a great shock to us um, when the Drug Reform Committee, appointed by the government, presented a surprisingly liberal suggestion for a drug reform in December 2019 in Norway. Um, the mandate for this committee was to investigate and suggest a model for how to shift the response for possessing and using illicit drugs from the justice sector to the health sector. And <laughs> the objective, as most of us uh, understood it, was to provide better health to addicted people. Um, and during the hearings in this process, there were lots of organizations stressing that we should not forget the prevention work. It's, I mean, we warmly support that drug addicts receive better help and are not punished, but we should not forget the importance of prevention work. And then this suggestion, uh, uh, this, this report from this um, uh, from this uh, committee uh, was presented and they suggested the decriminalization of buying, using and possessing all kinds of drugs, not only as we expect, expected cannabis and heroin, but all kinds of drugs and not only for the heavy users, but for everyone. Um, I will... <laughs> To understand a bit more about um, how this was supposed to be implemented, uh, I have to show the treasure values. Actually, when this um, committee represented their suggestion, these values were higher. They were like, instead of two grams of heroin, it was five grams of heroin, it was like 15 grams of cannabis, and so on. Uh, and what um, the reason for these values, I mean, these were the threshold values that you could actually, if, if you were arrested with, this, uh, with uh, substances within these threshold values, you would not be, I mean, <laughs> if you were called by the police, you would not be arrested. But instead, you would be, they would take the, the, 
uh, substances away from you and you would have to go um, to a counseling unit in your uh, neighborhood and receive um, some information about um, the, the dangers of using these substances and you would uh, be uh, offered help. That was what would happen if you, <laughs> if you were caught within these treasure valleys. And in the, uh, in, the in the original suggestion, you could be um, possessing all of these substances within the treasure valleys at the same time. That means that an 18 years old boy at a party with all these substances at the same time would not risk more than, of course, losing all his stuff, which means a kind of a lot of money. But otherwise, nothing else than that you had to go to receive some advice in your neighborhood, in a municipality. Uh, when the government uh, this year, in February this year, um, uh, presented their suggestion, they had changed it a bit. These are the, the treasure values that they presented. Uh, and you are not able to possess, you could not possess more than three of these substances at the same time uh, without being, risked, without being uh, arrested for, for possessing them. So they have changed it a bit. And this has been criticized, of course, by the user organizations because they are, uh, their argument is that um, the heavy users should be able to have like doses, user doses for two or three days on them without being arrested. And the problem for us, concern with young people, is that these treasure values, values um, don't take into consideration what these doses means to an, an experienced, experimental user, like an 18-year-old third grader in high school, for instance. Because these doses, as many of you know, are quite a lot of, of kind of an experimental doses to them. It is also the, the other kind of radical change uh, with this suggestion, um, when it moved from um, the justice system to the health system, um, is that this will not, uh, not be recorded anymore. Today, you risk, um, you risk um, that it will be, will be, uh, be noted in a criminal record, but in the suggestion, this will not happen anymore. And not in any kind of records anymore, like you have in Portugal, for instance, where you have those so, uh, kind of um, society security, um, have this, um, this um, what did I call it? <laughs> Uh, we do have this record um, for, like, instance, the army to look into if they don't want uh, young people at risk in in uh, in this, their services. This was supposed. This was suggested to be totally removed. So. Um, there, one of the reasons for the people that wanted this reform is that uh, we have a drug policy in Norway that has totally failed. And we do have a problem with overdose deaths in Norway. There is no question about that. But our argument is that this uh, is not uh, the solution for, for doing something about this. And there's, there, there is not a single penny in the suggestion for improving the, the um, treatment system or the or um, 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 for, for improving the treat treatment system or the treatment for the heavy drug users in any way. Um, and in many ways, the drug policy in Norway is quite successful. As I show you here, 92% of youngsters. Um, this is from the school surveys in Norway, and this is the freshest one. It's actually presented last week. 92% of youngsters between 14 and 19 have not tested cannabis at all. Um, and, and this <laughs> goes more or less for the adult population too. Um, I'll just find my little note. Uh, when you look at, into the adult population, 
it's only 2.5% of the adults that have used cannabis the last four weeks. And we do have um, a kind of um, grown acceptance about, uh, among um, young people to use cannabis. It's still like, it's not accepted among them. It's not very popular. It's still kind of stigmatized in the way that we were discussing yesterday. That means a lot for, for the prevention work and how, and how to prevent young people to start using cannabis. But today it's like, um, of the third graders of high school, 25% of boys have tried cannabis last year, and 15% of the girls. But the usage pattern in Norway is like that. Um, this one-fourth of the boys have tried it, but the pattern is like they try it, experiment a couple of times, sometimes, but the vast majority don't continue using cannabis. So in, the, in that way, uh, we have a quite a low usage in Norway. Um, and it's actually at the bottom uh, in the Western Europe when it comes to, to um, prevalence amongst both the adult population but also uh, among the youngsters. So, in many ways, you could say that the Norwegian drug policy is quite successful, but, we, but of course, we have to, to, um, um, to help young people not starting using drugs at all. So, that is to say. Um, um, as a result of this, or in, <laughs> in, from that approach, from the prevention approach, um, our message to the government and to, um, to, to uh, um, whoever would like to, to change the drug policy in Norway, our message is do not gamble with our young people. Because we have managed in many, many ways to, to keep it low, to, to keep the usage low. We have still challenges to, uh, to lower the use, but this is a massive experiment with our young people. Um, and the knowledge base that is presented in this report, that the government refers to when they argue for this, um, for this uh, um, reform, is, uh, and I quote, research does not provide empirical evidence to suggest that decriminalization necessarily leads to a change in prevalence. And that's quite a very weakly, vaguely um, uh, put it from their side. And it's quite interesting because kind of, um, kind of um, researchers dealing with this every day, and then especially uh, both the medical association, but first and foremost, uh, the National Institute of Public Health. They have been quite clear, um, and in several hearings, have stressed that this research is methodologically weak, has low transfer value, and is irrelevant to the Norwegian context. So it's interesting in many ways what happened when it disc the, the criminalized uh, drugs in other countries, but the way they are doing it and the low prevalence in Norway and the, the way the politics are changing makes these um, examples irrelevant to the Norwegian context. So they are saying that you will probably um, experience um, a race in the prevalence among young people and in the population if we go through with this reform, the way it is uh, suggested today. And <laughs> for us as an organization, it's very, it's very strange to see that the government is not listening to these inputs for such a kind of heavy institute as this one. And still argue that um, this is an important uh, human right issue to go through with this suggestion for a reform. Okay, so um, I will uh, I will guide you through four of our major concerns with this reform, uh, and that is um, that when uh, it's still supposed to be illegal, it's quite a, it's in a political majority in Norway saying that they still want drugs to be illegal in Norway. 
but we are afraid that drugs will be perceived as legal when the risk of detection is low, because it still is, uh, especially for people, for young people living in the western part of Oslo or Norway. I mean, normally the people are more active, have more to do among um, the east and Oslo, where the, the more um, criminality among young people. So the risk of detection for kind of lots of groups are quite uh, low, actually. And then if, they, uh, if the rumor goes that the, the, the reactions are like zero to them. I mean, I've talked to my young sons about this. Do you think it's a huge risk if you are caught with some marijuana, that they take it from you and have to go to kind of counseling for half an hour, where they give, give you some information? Do you think that will, um, that, <laughs> that will stop? young people for using marijuana? Do you think that feels like a risky situation? And they are like, no. And I think most of us recognize ourselves in that. And it's been, they have been, uh, the, the National Institute for Public Health have been doing res um, um, surveys among young people between 18 and 30 years, asking them, if you did not risk to be arrested for using drugs, do you think you would try it? And 22%, one out of five, of the young people that has not tried cannabis said that, yeah, maybe I would try it then. And this is a survey, but anyway, I think most people and most young people feel like that. I was part of a, I was part of a, um, <laughs> when I was young, I was part of a kind of gang that where several of my friends used cannabis, and actually, the risk of being detected and having um, the criminal record kind of spoiled kept me from trying to use cannabis uh, in that environment. So I think lots of people uh, recognize, um, they recognize the way of thinking about young people. Our second ma major concern, and I have to turn around to see what Seth say here. Um, that this proposal actually eliminates the current existing alternative sentencing methods used for young people to help them out of early stage of drug use unless they voluntarily choose them. Um, and that is we have a really good system, but it really needs to be improved. But we have a good system today where people under 18 and in some areas up to 24 years can in change of... Um, uh, in change of being punished or having this in the criminal record, um, deliver urine tests and receive help. And they actually have, <laughs> they actually have more chances, up to five chances to do that. So they can kind of break the agreement and still have new chances. And what we know from where they used this method in a very good way is that young people are saying that they don't realize that they have a problem before after like two, three, four months. They need to be kind of um, framed into this system and to be kind of forced to receive help before they actually realize themselves that they were on their way into a risky behavior pattern or that they have problems. And that is one of the problems with this uh, suggestion from, from the government because they are supposed to meet with this group, offering them help. But normally, at this early stage, and we want to reach uh, the young people at an early stage, they don't realize themselves that they have a problem. And this is, this is why we mean it. It means a lot, this framing we have within the criminal system today, to kind of help them, to help themselves. And we also see, uh, and I was mentioning this uh, before when I said <laughs> how I, uh, what kind of hindered me from using it when I was younger and my discussion with my own children about this, that um, this criminal record also gives young people a good reason to say no to drugs. And it was very well this explained here in the last presentation uh, how much we all want to be able to belong and how great the pressure is to use drugs if that is something that the other, that your peers are doing. And it's important young people tell, that or tell us that themselves, that they need this, I mean, something outside themselves, parents, the law, whatever, 
to have someone to point at and say, they don't allow me. <laughs> Not having to, to kind of uh, make all the arguments themselves because that's difficult and you want to belong. And I actually lose that reason. I mean, you spend some time going to this uh, uni to, to receive the advice, but still it's not the same as risking, um, um, risking your know, kind of clean uh, criminal record like you do today. And um, the fourth argument, and my last in, in this presentation, is something really important. I think that most of us as parents know how much um, it means to still be involved and still be informed when the people are, when the youngsters are between 16 and 18 years old. That are more or less the two first years of high school. Uh, at least it was for my sons. Um, but what will change if you, if you move this from the justice system to the health system is the same that goes for L, uh, um, any other health um, question that you are not supposed anymore to be involved as a parent. In many ways, that's quite, I think that's quite right when it comes to health issues. But we have to know that this is a kind of massive, huge uh, change um, when it comes to how uh, we will be followed up as parents if we move it from, to the health system. We, uh, as parents, will uh, have to meet with this uh, advisory unit um, when the children are under 18 years old. So we will sit there with the children and receive the same information that you shouldn't use the substances so that you can, have, you can receive treatment. But after that, you have no right to any insight in what your child, whether or not it accepts it, uh, if it starts some kind of treatment for dropout, you will not be informed and so on. And I think to most parents, that kind of is a dramatical change. And we know how much parents' involvement actually means. Um, many children would probably want their ch the parents to be involved. But I think it's, uh, I think it's a huge uh, difference not to have the right to be involved like you have today. Because within the criminal system, I will, as a parent, have the right to all information um, at the same level as my youth. And I think this change has been undercommunicated in this debate. And from a parent's perspective, means a lot. And of course, from the young people's perspective too. Even, though don't they, even, 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 even if they're not, don't, even if they don't even realize it themselves. So we are not against a drug reform. Um, we um, we uh, mean that the there needs to be an improvement in the treatment offered to, to um, drug abusers and addicted people. Uh, we also mean that the, the addicted heavy users should not be punished. They actually are not punished in Norway today. It's, it's very important to stress that. They are not punished, but it's important to have within today's legal system um, to find a way um, to, to kind of uh, make a difference between the heavy users and other users, young people and, and what you call recre recreational users. And of course, um, we mean, I was talking about the system we have today where you can uh, deliver urine, urine tests and receive help. We need that system to be improved. It's working quite well in some areas of Norway. It should be working the same way in every area of Norway to be kind of a follow up the best practices of how to do this. At its best, it's, it's, a, <laughs> it's a very good system and helps a lot of young people out of drug use. Uh, and of course, we need better information, better prevention programs, both targeted and aimed at young people and also their parents. And um, we need more people to receive help to live drug-free lives. This is, <laughs> for people that don't know Norwegian politics, maybe a bit um, and, and a kind of awkward map, but I just have to show you what the situation is like politically in Norway. Um, Octis, our umbrella organization, um, 
they ask the political parties, um, and it's also found in the programs, it, do you want to decriminalize the use and possession of narcotic, narcotic drugs for everyone? This is the situation now, after they have all made their political programs. Uh, but before I can say something about that, but there was a really excitement, exciting moment in politi political history when it comes to this, uh, this spring, because um, the three parties that uh, still are um, governing, uh, governing Norway, like the Conservative Party, which is called Høyre, and, uh, and Venstre, which is a Liberal Party, and the Christian Democrats, uh, the one blinking here, they, they did this suggestion, and, um, and, uh, and the Christian Democrats, which <laughs> are actually against the criminalization, they had uh, agreed to support the two other parties um, in this, in the parliament, um, in exchange for some other polit political issues. I won't talk about that, but anyway, <laughs> that was the kind of agreement they made between, between themselves. Um, and we were really worried because if we didn't have um, the social democrats called Arbeiderpartiet in Norway um, to not support this suggestion, then the majority would vote for it. So, uh, and also the two other parties um, that were against it, like the center party and uh, the left wing, the, the right wing party, Fremskrittspartiet did not support this, but it was important for us to, to make this issue, this question, um, uh, to make this question important for them in their process and, and, and among their voters. Because we saw that there was a, we were talking about yesterday, the silent majority. We knew that there was a, there was a silent majority in Norway that did not want this, that did not, wa not, wa did not know what actually was going on. They thought this was about heavy drug users and how to help them, and did not, um, uh, and did not know that this also implied a kind of um, huge change in how young people were supposed to be treated within this system. That much of the prevention work we are doing today would kind of totally fall apart with this uh, suggestion. So, what was important for us, just to go back, um, I, I can't go back, yeah. Um, what was first and foremost to, um, to secure the no in the Social Democrat Party. Okay, how did we do this? Um, I received, and other organizations too, received a telephone from parents that were really worried. They said, we can't have this. This suggestion is dangerous for our young people, but we think it's difficult to raise our voices ourselves, and we need professional organizations to do this because this debate is so hard to stand, and we, we, we don't dare to be there. We think it's difficult, we think it's difficult to meet all the arguments, we think it's difficult to meet all the harassment. We need you to be there for us. As organizations, Knuter is one of the organizations, the FMR. Um, we would work with this anyway, we had done that already. But we saw the need for, um, to mobilize people out there that needed to know more about what was going on and that needed us to help they raise their voice. So the four organizations you see here, it's the drug, um, um, the, the drug Police Association is what they call themselves, the NNPF, and the Youth Against Narcotic Drugs, uh, FMI, and we. We sat down together and say, okay, how can we do this? Uh, I mean, this was, <laughs> this, is, this was going really fast. We were in a, in a rush. We didn't have much time. We actually didn't have much resources either. But my organization said, okay, we give this priority. We normally work with alcohol because <laughs> that's a huge problem in our way. But now we have to, to do something because this is really dangerous as we perceive it. Um, so we sat down. I'll show you later how uh, this, this webpage and the message. And um, said, okay, we make this 
parents' appeal to mobilize people. And then we'll ask the other organizations here and more organizations if they want to join us. Um, yeah, I just this is <laughs> this is from uh, um, this is what uh, this was from the, the kind of starting of this uh, this discussion when we when we had formed the parents' appeal because we were receiving kind of a massive attack from the user organizations and the the uh, legalization movement. Uh, as I said attacking us for not being parents and representing parents, even though there might be some of the people that has actually signed the petition that were not parents and so forth and so forth. My, my, my <laughs> youngest son said, hey, what is going on? This is really dangerous. I don't understand. We can stand there and, and be part of this discussion because I've never seen something like it. And that was also the conclusion of who is to be the prime minister now, um, Jonas Gard Støre. Um, when they have decided not to support the reform, uh, that he has, he had a, hardly ever um, seen such a climate uh, for the debate than than, than this one, um, and uh, <laughs> it's quite uh, it's quite difficult. We we also experienced that young people that were supposed to um, to spread the matches, I mean, to represent the parents. Um, the, also this uh, um, the parents appeal they didn't they didn't dare to do it anyway they withdraw from the videos we were making and so on because they uh, they didn't dare to stand to, to receive all the harassment that they expected and that they saw that other people actually received on the web page so what we did we made this web page um, um, this is an original course uh, I have to tell you we when we, we wanted to, to make this, we were looking at this, we thought, okay, there must have been parents mobilizing, like in the, the US and Canada, because of what was going on there. So we looked into other web pages and saw, okay, how have they been doing it? Uh, even the logos, we decided not to have this prohibition sign with the cannabis leaf logo. We wanted to signalize uh, and express uh, caring and warmth and concern for our young people. So you see the logo there. It's like a parent with a child being taken care of. That was the reason for us to choose that logo. And you see on the two pictures we have chosen two, they are all about parents uh, taking care of the children, good relationships, good relationships, good relationships between uh, young people and, and the parents, like we want um, the world to be like. So not, uh, not kind of showing all the challenges, but how we want it to be as parents against drugs. Um, so in the web page you find arguments why we think this drug reform suggestion uh, is not a good idea. Um, and the people have the possibility to sign the, the petition. Um, so that's what we, we ask people to do, and it's of course open to other people than parents. All people that care about young people are of course very welcome to sign this one. And then of course we had a web page. Um, now I'm sorry, the social media, we were on, on Facebook um, <laughs> to reach more people. And what we mainly did in this Facebook web page was to give Information we have um, in in my staff, we have a person that is really good at making small films. So we made a lot of small films, giving out information on why we thought this was not a good idea and what alternatives we wanted. Um, and this is the kind of the front figures of this um, this network was me and the general secretary of the the drug police association. Uh, we are both we are both moms <laughs> in the kind of uh, she has smaller kids than me, so we all, all always started by saying we are moms and we are concerned you know to to both because we think it 's uh, important that people recognize themselves as parents in this, but also because this legalization movement were criticizing us for not uh, representing parents and blah blah i don 't still don 't understand what what, what was their issue, but anyway, uh, it uh, felt important for us to do. But this, um, 
this also provided a very important uh, platform for other people to express their opinion about this reform. Um, so we have researchers, we had um, ordinary parents, we have people from the police, we had uh, people working with uh, prevention work among young people um, and rehabilitation work, we had drug addicts, we had all kinds of people that expressed how they felt about this, uh, this um, suggestion. Uh, but we also um, became an important platform for the political parties that were against this. This is uh, Trygve Slagsvold <laughs> Vedum. He is the, the, uh, the leader of the Centre Party, and they will probably form part of the government now um, this autumn. Uh, he was um, used the, the parents' appeal to express himself about reform. We had from the Social Democrats, he's quite, um, this is Jan Berlid, um, he supported it. Uh, this is one of the majors from uh, one. Uh, this is the one major from the Social Democrats in in one of the in one of the Norwegian cities that kind of um, stressed her uh, her um, warnings against this uh, um, suggestion. And this is um, Sylvie Listau, which who is uh, we knew would be the new leader of Fremskrittspartiet. Uh, the right-wing party that were also against it. So we provided a platform for them to express themselves to the voters, of course, but also to su support this, um, this uh, parents' appeal and to spread it, because it means a lot for us to spread that it's being spread within their network to have, uh, like their voters, to, to sign our petition. Yeah, and this is also from the Christian Democrats, and the leader of the Oslo um, group party. Um, <laughs> we, <laughs> yeah, okay, so that means a lot to them. We were also doing other kinds of things, of course. We were lobbying, uh, talking to people in the parliament, talking to people, uh, politicians locally, meeting in, in their kind of local groups. Um, but telling our, giving our arguments and, and of course participating in debates. Um, we were also in local and national media. Um, you see we were in television, in the radio and of course in, in the newspapers. Uh, and part of the lobbying was actually before the Social Democrats Congress. We called together with organi other organizations all um, uh, all the delegates telling them about our point of view on this reform. Because we knew within the Social Democrat Party, they had a kind of, they were really, they really disagreed on, upon, this, uh, upon this question. So we knew that if we lose the Social Democrats, we will lose in this one. Then, it, then the reform will go through. So this was a really great importance. And uh, another thing, we have parents' meeting. More, several of our organizations have parents' meeting. We meet with parents in our prevention programs. And we are not afraid to talk politics in these prevention programs because we know that part of an effective prevention is um, to the, the, the kind of politics that are performed both in the, the local society and nationally. So in all the parents' meetings we had in junior high and high school, we told them about this reform and we said, you probably hear about this now because young people think that drugs will soon be illegal and you should know what this is about and you should know that this concerns us because we, we don't want more young people to use drugs and this, these are our arguments, this is why we are against it. So we actually spent some, just some time in our parents' meeting also talking politics. Um, the result um, <laughs> for so long uh, is that this is, this is when we had, um, what, what was it like 36, uh, 26,000 uh, subscribers um, and in, in advance uh, the same day as the Social Democrats were opening their Congress, we handed 
all these subscriptions over to the chair, uh, Anakin Whitfeld is her name, the chair of the, um, of the um, editorial, no, sorry. Are you excited what I'm going to say? Are you? <laughs> Let's see if I can find it. Yeah, uh, of the editorial committee of the, um, of the uh, Social Democrat Party. And we actually knew that she, she had not uh, expressed herself publicly about this because they wanted to have a kind of free debate within the, within the party. But we know that it meant a lot for them within this committee to have to kind of <laughs> to kind of um, uh, show that we had all these parents actually mobilizing against it because the youth organizations in Norway have been very active given a lot of space in the national media and what we also see is that most people when we talk to them kind of normal ordinary people out there being concerned with the children they have not understand what was actually going on because the national media have presented this as a reform for heavy drug users, not taking, not kind of raised the discussion about what this will mean to, to young people. So we feel that one of the reasons why <laughs> this kind of concern have actually been given some space at all in national local media is because of the parents' petition means a lot. We know that there are several organizations and especially uh, and especially ACTIS, um, our umbrella organization, they have been a lot of important lobbying together with us and that means a lot, especially when it comes, com it comes to this, um, uh, what is happening within these few months, you know, before they are going to vote, they were going to vote for this in the parliament in June. That means a lot. But I mean, in the long run, to make um, the public aware of what kind of debate this is and what is, is at risk. What is at risk? We see that as one of the important things that we as organizations have to do. Um, I said, I mean, I started by saying that the Dardabaida Party, the Social Democrats, <laughs> both know that this reform. Uh, it was quite divided, but they landed on that. And I think one other important reason is that Jonas Gostöre, the, the, the next prime minister, he is clearly against it. He's clearly against the criminalizing drugs for young people, for other people than the, than the heavy users. He is very open to find solutions for decriminalizing uh, drug use for the heavy users, but not for all groups. So because of that, uh, the, the Social Democrats voted no. Uh, we, of course, also delivered this um, list, <laughs> which is not the paper list anymore, of course, um, to the leader of the, the committee for uh, um, health and social questions in, in uh, the parliament. He's a Christian Democrat in a way. So he was openly against it, but wouldn't vote for it. I pity them a bit, but anyway, that was, they actually asked people to vote against it.
Yeah, do you want me to say that? Yeah? Okay, um, we won the first battle. Uh, with this being voted down in the parliament, but we know that the legalization deba debate is to come. It's already going on in our way. We receive a lot of, I would call it, <laughs> negative influence from the US and the Canada. With, uh, yeah, that has been discussed here today. And that's influencing young people. They are on the internet, they are reading all the arguments pro-legalization. We have the cultural impact. I mean, cannabis being exposed in, in films and, and, and whatever young people are kind of exposed to. Uh, and we have this, uh, the user organizations that are mainly pro-legalization. We have two political parties that want legalization, so we know that there will be, um, <laughs> there will, there, there's a kind of debate to come. The climate will probably be just as hard as it used to be in this debate, so we have to find a way to mobilize people, to make them aware at what, uh, on what is at risk, and we have to find a way to, to kind of raise the silent majority's voices in a good way. So we are not looking forward to it, but we, we are, <laughs> what you say, trying to prepare for a new battle, so to say, in the long run. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for repeating those words for our online participants. And as the sound is on, um, I can continue with the questions we have received. The first one was, would be more towards the beginning of your presentation, is that are you implying that teens need an adult someone or perhaps a parent that they can say will be distressed if they use when they're dealing with peer pressure? Would that actually like help? And In what way? Sorry. Like when um, that the, a child is saying that, oh, my parent will be distressed if I use drugs, would mm -hmm. that be a valuable argument for their peer pressure? as they are old teens and might be like... Um yeah, I think so, and that was, I mean, that was presented earlier today, but they say they actually do care a lot about what the parents uh, thinks and feels about this. Um, and sometimes the, pr the problem is that parents are not very good at sp talking to the children about this and, and how they feel about this and, <laughs> and, and kind of sharing their opinions and concern. So, yeah, I think it means a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Second question would be from Monica Parsanti. She is like she would like to know if the, if you noticed a difference in your country uh, regarding the use of drugs among you young people because of COVID, and what uh, the politicians reacted if there was any response, because this proposal to decriminalize doesn't consider that young people are more at risk now because of the pandemic and could be encouraged to use. Did you see any difference throughout this pandemic and the reaction of the politicians? Yeah, actually, the, this, this new national school survey was presented this week and it showed that the use had gone, dropped a, a bit, like with one percentage, actually, because they don't meet at school and parties. And I mean, drugs are often, um, are often offered you uh, and part of kind of party uh, when you meet at school or friends at a party. So, there has been a change and it's also been difficult to find to buy cannabis in Oslo and Norway for periods during the pandemic, so that means a bit. Um, mm -hmm. But I think things will go back to normal. <laughs> but, uh, but part of the pandemic, this not, has nothing to do with the, with the COVID-19, but of course the, the debate, the discussions about this is um, influencing young people, uh, especially because the legalization movement, uh, they are stressing that this it's not a very dangerous substance, and it, it was mentioned yesterday too, it's less dangerous than alcohol, so what's the problem, you know? And that is influencing young people, of course. Mm -hmm. they their parents are using alcohol and think that's fine and nice, so, and if drugs are more or less the same, then why should that be dangerous? So, of course, that is influencing young people. Yeah, mm. thank you. A last one from, or two actually from online, and then I will go and ask the people around here. Um, does your parent network see any difference in girls' and boys' attitudes towards drug use? We haven't gone into that, no. actually. <laughs> okay. mm. And what, according to the network's best practices in handling teens caught with drugs, like that parents would do? What parents would do? Yeah, in your network, like, have you seen any um, best practices of how they handle their... Um, the teens that are caught with drugs? 
Yeah, we do have the best practice ourselves in RGT, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, but we are doing, like I've said, uh, it was presented how, how important it is for, for early today to involve parents uh, in the prevention work, and we are having, both we and the Narcotic, the Drug Police Association, having parents meeting, saying, um, both giving information, we are doing, um, uh, and, and kind of facilitating the parents talk to each other, speak about these matters and, and kind of agree on, on, on the same rules for everyone. I mean, it should be easy to contact me if you're concerned. I would call you if I'm concerned about your child. We, are, we agree that they should be picked up from parties at that time. There is, they're not to be supposed to party alone. And that we agree that we want to facilitate for activities that are drug-free for our children and we want to involve in the society and, and so on. Yeah. So that's one good practice, and of course the other one I was talking about, this, uh, we call them um, drug contracts, where they, instead of having uh, the names on the criminal record, are giving the chance to be drug free. So we know that the best way, when they're doing this really good, it's really working and effective. Mm. That's very good, thanks. Thank you. Are there any questions here in the audience? Over there too. Oh, three. All right, then, so thank you very much for a great presentation. Um, uh, you've done a wonderful work, and uh, I was thinking whether you have a blueprint. I mean, for one, I would like to copy it in Denmark, so what would be your sort of speak uh, tips for mobilizing parents in Denmark? I mean, in this political climate, it's it's very important what the parents say because, you know, we as clinicians or experts, researchers, we can have an opinion, but uh, it's of course difficult to navigate in from a political standpoint, but uh, the voters, the parents, the, the people out there, the real people, their voice is very important. So to mobilize parents in, in Denmark or any other countries, what would you say? What, what, what would be the first thing you would, you would give as a tip, please? It's a very good question because it's very difficult. Um, but I, I, we were discussing this when we kind of discussed what will be the message. But I think that parents must really feel that something is at risk. Um, because, I mean, all of us working in this field every day knows that lots, I mean, are at risk all the time, but still it's it's, it's, it's difficult to, to mobilize them. Uh, but we know that most people, we know that most parents don't want their children to use drugs. <laughs> so that, if that was something to grab, you know. And then we say, okay, this is really liberal. They're losing all the excuses not to use drugs anymore. Are you aware of this? Uh, you have to do something, you have the chance to do it. We give you the, the one way to do it and we will carry the message on. Um, <laughs> I had kind of a receipt for, for this one, but I mean, like I said, we, we have, to, we have to, to fight the next battle now, and we have to sit down once more and say, what do we do now, what will be our message, how do we actually reach the silent major majority? But I think to reach the silent majority is very, uh, uh, very exciting. That is what we're doing in this parents' meeting that was, I was talking about. I've been to parents' meeting myself, and they are always, I mean, police are coming and saying, you should be aware, you should not go to this, your summer house and let the, the children party alone at home. And you should be aware that there are some drug use now in the neighborhood and you should know that there's a taxi providing spirits. And then the majority, they are sitting there, the children being kind of <laughs> ordinary children, not using drugs, not interested in alcohol. And we are sitting there thinking, what has this to do with me? Um, is there something wrong with my child? Because it's not part of this partying, whatever it is. So, I mean, to, to this kind of positive, um, responsive um, enforcement way of thinking, I think that's really important. I think that's kind of the clue of this, uh, this kind of parents' appeal that we did to. We kind of mobilize all the people that feel that they're not being heard. There are a lot of politicians there saying this is a good solution. We didn't know about it. Why didn't you tell us? We don't want this. Uh, but lots were at risk within a short time or period. So <laughs> you have to find something at risk that kind of really matters. I don't know. 
I saw that same from the US and Canada when, when parents were mobilizing. They knew something is going on right now. We have to do it now, otherwise it will be too late. I don't know if that was a good answer, but I think it's very difficult myself. Thank you. We have a question over there as well. Thank you. But two related questions. One, was this discussed at all in the election campaign, or was it sort of hidden and not dared? And since there seems to be a silent majority, what, what are the forces that drive some politicians to, to, to push this so forcefully? Are there any forces behind that? Yeah, this was discussed in, in uh, no, this, this spring and summer, actually. But then you had a UN report on uh, the climate, so that was kind of overshading, not mean <laughs> in a positive way. Um, what was kind of the, the most important debates um, in this parliament election, actually. But this has been important to some of the parties. And, and the reason why this has... I, I think it, I, it's... It, it's um, what is going on in Norway, it's not a very corrupt country. And it's, I mean, it's not money involved in a way when it comes to what politicians support, like we felt from the US, for instance. I mean, uh, those kind of issues. But the, the user organizations have suddenly had a very kind of central pos position in the, the debate uh, when it comes to drug policy in Norway. And it has been important for many of the politicians uh, especially the health minister, which he's from the Conservative Party, that we used to be able to rely on in these questions. But he's suddenly kind of um, learned from the youth organization that this is the solution to the drug problem in Norway in some way. Um, and, and that is also kind of uh, be, been a part of the, this whole debate climate and who you're supposed to listen to, that the youth organization are the central and they are the ones kind of invited to hearings, invited to presentation, but all the prevention organization, like we are representing you, the UN, me, and the other ones, are not being, I've been kind of, um, I don't know in what way, but not listened to and, and made less important and not uh, taken into consideration at all when we discuss what is important for the future drug policy work. Uh, so, but, but all in all, I also feel that, uh, and I think you can recognize that for other countries, that prevention work, especially when it comes to kind of, uh, um, what do you call it, allmän prevention. Through? General prevention have, has a very low status. It's not being discussed, it's not being understood. Um, but harm reduction has kind of dominated the way of thinking drug policy in Norway in many ways. That's a very kind of short analysis, but I think that is what is kind of, uh, yeah, making it so hard to come through with the prevention perspectives in, uh, in this debate. And as, as I said, I mean, this report can say that it will probably not to lead, to, I mean, the, the knowledge we have about what has been happening in other countries implies that we will probably not have a race. Uh, of use in Norway, and that's good enough for the government. It's, it's very special, instead of saying, we have a drug problem, we have to love the use, so why not find methods to do that? Instead of saying, we can go through with this, because probably there won't be a kind of high race in use, so let's experiment a bit. It's, I think it's very strange, I don't understand it. I don't understand why the government is not listening to the, to the health experts either. But I think that's youth organization being kind of dominating the, the debate. Thank you very much. Um, I don't want to cut too short of the break, but I don't know if you still had a question you would like to ask. Like a very short question, very brief, maybe a few minutes, and then we can uh, continue to the break. <laughs> I often think like a lot of the decriminalization arguments draw on like social labeling theory and I just wanted to kind of draw on your sociology background and like uh, how do you counter that erroneous narrative? Um, Please, you have to say it once more, oh. sorry, you're Irish. <laughs> how do you, how do you, how, sorry, yes, I tend to mumble and speak too quickly. <laughs> So uh, often, like the decrimin like a, a decriminalization argument, like will draw on the fact that you know, um, when you label someone as a criminal, that makes it like a, that that means they will identify that, and it's that's 
what they will be forever. Uh, how do you ca counter that erroneous narrative? Uh, yeah, that's true for some. Of course it is. And it's true that some are, have part of their future spoiled when, it's, when they're in the criminal record or kind of, kind of spoiled the criminal record. But we argue uh, against it that mainly the police are, um, uh, mainly we are there to help. And the framing of the criminal, uh, this being criminal, really motivates and helps young people to get out of the misuse. But of course, stigmatization is part of the problem for some people, but police is not anymore like they might have used to act 20 years ago. That's not the way they're working today. Um, and, and the police, they are really important for us, for young people and parents to, to what do you call it, to, to find the use, I mean, to avdekke, um, my English is poor, bad today, um, to discover uh, use of, of uh, drugs. I mean, other people, teachers and others might do that too, but it's mainly the police doing that. And if the police didn't do that, with all the consequences in, in both positive and negative ways, um, many young people would not be able to receive help. So that's the way we kind of argue in that way. Mm. But of course, that's part of the problem too, the stigmatization in that way. Mm. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for uh, answering all the questions. And of course, also thank you for all the questions anyway, for the audience. I want to thank you a lot for coming here and sharing your organization's work and everything. And okay. a little gift from Denmark for you as well. Applause. <laughs> thank you very much.